wrestlers, everybody. I have a very interesting speaker with us today, and I'll introduce him in a moment. And uh, we have a uh, short Bible passage I'm going to read to you from Psalm 8, which is a familiar psalm to many of you. Um, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God, and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You put all things under their feet, all the sheep and the oxen and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful uh, reminder that we are very small and your universe is great uh, and it's the work of your hands and we acknowledge you as our creator and our redeemer. And we thank you for this time together to meditate and think about how to apply your word to our world, to our lives. I pray that you guide us and our speaker. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, one announcement to make that uh, Mills reminded me, there is a lovely Palm Sunday concert coming up this afternoon. How lovely is thy dwelling place is the theme with the National Presbyterian Chancel Choir and the Loudoun County High School Concert Choir singing at 5 p.m. So stick around. You may want to come and enjoy that. And uh, a lot of other things in the bulletin today. And of course, Easter Sunday is coming up. So please uh, check out all the news in the bulletin. Now, our speaker today is Dr. Ed Ift. And he's been a member of our class. He's been faithfully coming to this class. But I did have, had no idea about his experience, his background, so I want to share a little bit of that with you. The title of his talk is Everything You Wanted to Know About Satellites But Were Afraid to Pass. He's retired after a long career at the State Department, but he's still working part-time there as an international relations officer. Uh, he was an adjunct professor at Graduate School of Foreign Service at Georgetown, author of many articles in scholarly journals published in the U.S., in Europe, in Russia, and chapters in two books published by the United Nations. He a, uh, has a PhD in physics from Ohio State. He spent a year in Moscow State University in graduate school. He heads the Office of International Program Policy at NASA headquarters. He is Executive Secretary of U.S.-Soviet Space Cooperation Agreement. He was a senior State Department negotiator for the START Treaty and the Treaty Inspector, U.S. START Treaty Inspector. He's a senior State Department negotiator for the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. He's a dep he was deputy director for the On-Site Inspection Agency and senior advisor for the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. So you can see the common thread of concern in his in his life and his career. So it, it's fascinating, and he's going to share with us today some of the unclassified work that he's done around satellites. And so it ought to be fascinating. Thank you for coming in. Thank you very much, Paul. That's very generous. I mean, most of that is, uh, is way in the past, of course. Um, I should make clear that Kristen and I are not actually members of this church. We belong to a church over in Virginia, to which we have strong ties, but we, we are strongly attracted to National Presbyterian, and, and we like this class, so that's why you only see us maybe once a month. Um, Eventually, we'll get this sorted out, I think. I actually have a long history with National Presbyterian Church. In the late 50s, I was a student working at the Naval Research Laboratory, living in a horrible slum apartment on 15th Street, and I always went to National Presbyterian downtown on Sunday mornings. Occasionally, President Eisenhower showed up there. So, why are we talking about satellites uh, in Sunday school? Um, good question. Somebody already asked me that this morning. What really happened was that Paul had an opening for this morning and he was looking for speakers and I thought, well, 
um, I could throw something together that I think would be interesting for this class. Um, apologies to Woody Allen for the not very original title. But if you want a theological justification, the, the passage that Paul read you from Psalm 8 basically says that we, have, we are stewards of this planet. A lot of what we know about the big problems with this planet, climate change, the ozone hole, natural disasters, the status of crops, comes from satellites. And so we have to be interested in those. If we turn the satellites around and look outward at the universe, we can't do anything about what's going on out there, but it seems to me as Christians, we should be interested in that and we should marvel at the complexity and the beauty of what goes on in our universe. Um, I don't really work on satellites anymore. My, my field is arms control, so I'm primarily interested in satellites for the verification um, aspect of what they do. Uh, right now I'm thinking a lot about nuclear deterrence. I have the lead article in this month's Arms Control today. If your subscription has lapsed, you can, you can, you can see it online. But that's another, that's another, that's another uh, lecture. Um, so you've all seen a lot of pictures of satellites and satellite images. We don't want to waste time on that. But just to get you in the mood, here are a few images to begin with. This, of course, is the International Space Station, which is at, uh, in a circular orbit uh, about 220 miles high. Uh, since the year 2000, it's been continuously occupied by up to six people. It's, the room inside is like a five-room house with a couple of bathrooms. Um, and it's an amazing technical achievement, really. I think probably the science that it's done has been a little disappointing uh, compared to what people thought that we would be able to do, but nevertheless, uh, very important. The only access we have to it now, of course, is with the Russian Soyuz rockets, although Elon Musk, I guess, is, is trying to get there. This picture was taken by the shuttle after it uh, after it had a service mission. Here's the famous Hubble Space Telescope, a uh, huge success story. This has been in orbit since uh, 1990. The, the eight-foot mirror is right here. The optics, and then here's a big uh, shutter or lid that you can bring down to protect the sensitive optics and electronics from uh, things that might damage them. This picture was taken by the shuttle as it backed away from the Hubble after its final mission to, to service um, the telescope. And you, you've all seen the amazing pictures that it has sent back. If you turn that telescope around and point it down at the Earth, you've basically got one of our key intelligence satellites. It's basically the same, the same bird. This is a European spacecraft. You all know about the Global Positioning System. That's a military system. The military lets us and the rest of the world have degraded data from it. The rest of the world is afraid someday we're going to turn it off. And so the Europeans have developed their own system. This is called Galileo. The Russians have one called GLONASS. This is a constellation of 30 satellites in six different planes um, around the Earth, providing a very high quality uh, location data. Some of you have it in your cars or on your smartphones. This is a Landsat image. Landsat is uh, an Earth observation satellite which looks at the Earth in nine spectral bands. This, I think, is an image of Greenland, so you can get an idea of, of how the Landsat bird can track uh, changes related to climate change. This satellite can take about 700 images a day, and you can buy them, actually. And it's been actually quite valuable. This, this is 
what I would call an intelligence uh, image. This is from a Russian satellite. Uh, this says Skopvenia Automobil Techniki, which means an assemblage and accumulation of trucks. There are 500 oil tankers here parked in the desert in Syria. The Russians went back and bombed these later. I'm pretty sure it was here because we hadn't touched them. And so this, I mean, this was a major source of income for ISIL selling oil illegally to the Turks and other people, and the Russians went in and bombed these trucks to try to degrade um, that capability. Um, so, um, <clears throat> when I was here as a student in the late 50s, <clears throat> Sputnik went up. Sputnik 1, here it is, 1957. Basically, a basketball that beat. Um, they beat us, the Russians, the Soviets beat us into space. And that was when I first saw the ground track of a satellite. Here's a map of the world. You've seen these before. And what I began to see as a <coughs> stupid undergraduate, the ground track looked sort of like that, kind of like a sine wave. And I thought, well, that's weird. The satellite's going north. And then it turns around and goes south. Why would it do that? It's easy to see why it does that if you think in three dimensions. If you think in three dimensions, a satellite has to go in a plane in space which passes through the center of the Earth. So the satellite is going like this. So in fact, it is going north and then it's going south, and then it's going north again, and that's the reason for the funny-looking ground track. The inclination of the satellite <clears throat> would be expressed in degrees of latitude, and you can pick any latitude you want. If you fired straight east out of Cape Canaveral, you would probably be at, what, 30 degrees, 33 degrees, whatever the latitude of Florida is, and you would then pass over every point on the Earth at that latitude or lower. You can, the satellite will never be at a higher latitude than that. I hope that's, hope that's clear, but you can have any, any latitude that you want. Um, <clears throat> another thing that's very important is that while the satellite is moving in a fixed plane in space, the Earth is not standing still. The Earth is rotating underneath the satellite. If you're in low Earth orbit, 200 miles, 300 miles, it's going to take about an hour and a half to go once around. And when you come around the second time, you're not going to be looking at the same place as you were the first time. Ed, could you put that up on the windowsill so we sure. can see it better? Oh, okay, sure. So, <clears throat> if, for example, the satellite is over Florida, and on its next pass, an hour and a half later, the Earth will have rotated about 22 degrees, which is about 1,500 miles. So on the next pass, it's going to be where? Northern Texas, probably, something like that. And the next pass, and so on and so on. So you only get one shot at any given spot, you know, until you've had a number of uh, revolutions and you come back to where you were. So, if you're going to get if you're going to get further into how this all works, you have to think about Kepler's laws. <clears throat> Kepler was Johannes Kepler was <clears throat> a uh, a German astronomer and mathematician who derived these three important laws about motion of planets. He did this using data that was gathered by Tycho Brahe, who was a Danish astronomer. Uh, there's a big crater on the moon named for him. Tycho Brahe was a colorful character who once engaged in a stupid competition with some of his friends to see how much they could drink without urinating. <laughs> I guess this was beer, maybe it was water. 
do not try this at home, because his bladder burst and he died. But not before he gathered a lot of really good uh, data on the motion of the planets. And I thought for a long time that Kepler had used Newton's law of gravitation to derive his three laws, but in fact it was the other way around. Kepler's three laws were first, and Newton then used those to, in addition to the apple falling on his head, to derive the law of gravitation. So, what does this mean? This, this now, we've been able to generalize this to not just planets, but any object moving in an inverse square field. What does that mean? <clears throat> law of gravitation is that every object in the universe, including you, attracts every other object in the universe with a force which is equal to the universal gravitational constant times the mass of the first object, the mass of the second object, divided by the square of the distance between them. So this is an inverse square. And so Kepler derived, based on Tycho Brahe's data, his first law, which says that the orbit of any object moving in an inverse square field will be the intersection of a plane with a conic section. What does that mean? A conic section basically is a dunce cap, if I can draw that. Okay? Now, you intersect a plane with this. There are several ways of doing that. Suppose the plane intersects like that, what would the orbit be? Circle. Circle, exactly. Suppose it goes like that, it would be an ellipse. And a circle is just a special case of an ellipse. Suppose your intersection looks like that. It would be a parabola, right? And the object is not coming back. Okay? That's the first law. The second law, I think, is the most useful one. It says that this object, the planet, the satellite, will sweep out equal areas in equal time. You can deduce a lot about the motion of satellites from the second law. So, what that means is, here's the Earth, and here's a satellite, and say in one minute, it moves this far. Okay, well then, it has swept out this much area. Suppose you have a satellite that's further away. Then the area that it sweeps out in the same amount of time has to be the same, so it's going to move a much smaller distance in order for this area to equal this area. This means that there is an apportioned velocity for a satellite in every orbit. And that's the only velocity that can have in that orbit. Okay, So the further away you go, the slower you're going to be moving because you have to sweep out equal areas in equal times. So as you get higher and higher, you go slower and slower. As you get lower and lower, you get faster and faster. Another way to think about that is to keep from falling into the Earth, which is pulling on you with gravity, the closer you are, the faster you have to go to keep from plunging down. The third one, this is not suitable for Sunday school. We don't need to worry about that. Um, what else? There's some obvious differences, of course, between satellites and airplanes, and you, you know certainly what they are. An airplane can go Airplanes can go at any speed on the same path, and they do that all the time. As we just learned from Kepler's second law, satellites cannot do that. And I didn't know quite how to say that in a small space, but each orbit can, can only have one specific speed. Not necessarily the whole orbit. The Earth is in a circular orbit around the Sun, so it moves at the same speed all the time. If the Earth were in an ellipse, it would, in fact, speed up and slow down depending on where it was in the ellipse. Airplanes have continuous propulsion, otherwise they would fall down. Satellites 
basically have no propulsion. They don't need any once they're given their initial velocity, although they may have to maneuver a little bit. Uh, and then, of course, airplanes maneuver with aerodynamic surfaces. There's no air in space, so satellites maneuver by having thrusters which give little bursts of gas. <clears throat> Interrupt any time with questions. Okay, so here we go with what happens as you get higher and higher. As I said, in low Earth orbit, a couple hundred kilometers, you go once around in about an hour and a half. As you go up, the orbit time gets longer and longer until you get all the way to 35,000 kilometers, which is 22,000 miles, at which point the time for one trip around is 24 hours. <clears throat> this is highly convenient because that's the same time that it takes the Earth to rotate once on its axis. A satellite in that orbit is called a geosynchronous <clears throat> satellite. That is not use so useful at all unless, unless it's, a, it's over the equator. It's, over an it's in an equatorial orbit, because then it will appear to be stationary in the sky, because the satellite is going around at the same rate that you are on the ground, if you're, on the, if you're in the equator. This is why the DirecTV antenna on your roof is fixed, because it is staring at a geostationary satellite 22,000 miles high, and there's no need to track a satellite moving across the sky, which would be expensive and complicated. So this is the this is the so-called geostationary satellite, which is extremely useful for uh, communications in particular and, and for some other some other applications. <clears throat> How much can you see as you go up? This is surprising. This is not, I think, what your intuition would tell you. I mean, when you see these images from the shuttle or from the International Space Station, it's enormous. And you think, wow, I'm seeing half the Earth, at least a quarter of you. No, you're not. <clears throat> if you're in low Earth orbit, 500 kilometers, all you're seeing is 3.6%. And you can't see very well out to the horizon. You really can't. So if you deduct, say, 10 degrees, the only useful part of the Earth that you're seeing is like 1.5%. If you go all the way to geostationary orbit, you can see usefully about 34% of the Earth. This means that you could cover the entire Earth with three satellites, one over the Atlantic, one over the Pacific, one over the Indian Ocean. And then in theory, you've got everything covered. So, Ed, let me give an antidote. Yeah, In sure. 1958, I was in the astronomy club at Kansas State University, mm -hmm. and when the first satellite went up, there were all these questions about the decay of the orbit, how fast it was going. Mm -hmm. We were setting up on the Kansas Prairie, we had a telescope, a transit, and we had WWD, the Navy's time thing, yeah. running on a radio. And when the satellite crossed the transit, we said, Mark. Uh -huh. And that tape was then sent back to the Navy to mm -hmm. help calculate these first orbital mm -hmm. parameters. Mm -hmm. Interesting, yes. Well, when I was at NRL, the Naval Research Laboratory, um, and, and Sputnik 1 went up, the guys there were scrambling to build receivers that could receive the beeps that were coming down from, from Sputnik 1. Exactly. Okay, so, um, what's next? I uh, guess. So, why doesn't Hollywood understand this? <laughs> Hollywood, Hollywood has heard that we have geostationary satellites which are stationary. Hollywood has heard that we have satellites that can read license plates. I will neither confirm nor deny that we can read license plates, but okay, we have very high resolution. Hollywood thinks it's the same satellite. No, it's not. Hello, it's not the same satellite. You cannot 
read license plates from 22,000 miles out in space. The, the, the satellites that have very high resolution are in low Earth orbit, and they're traveling 17,000 miles around, as we just showed with the globe, and you get one shot. And the geostationary satellite is sending you weather pictures with big cloud masses and all that. I mean, if you had a one-foot resolution in low Earth orbit, geostationary orbit is like a hundred times further away, so your resolution is going to be a hundred times worse. And so, you remember 24? A lot of you watched from, you remember Chloe with their magic satellite? <laughs> I mean, Chloe, with a few clicks, could do fantastic things. And I, it was a great show, but there were many times when I wanted to throw something at the TV screen because, no, Chloe, no, 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 you can't do that. And also, we can have infrared, uh, infrared uh, detectors on satellites. We can have radar. I mean, one of Chloe's satellites actually was looking through brick walls and seeing people moving around, bad guys, inside the building. Can you do that? No. An infrared is measuring the temperature of the outer wall. That's all. And furthermore, you're certainly not going to do that from geostationary orbit. Poseidon Adventure, famous movie. There was a remake. The scenario is a passenger ship flips over upside down in the Indian Ocean. Probably can't happen, but okay, fair enough. And they don't know where it is. And they say, no problem, we'll use the geostationary satellite. It's always the geostationary satellite. And bam, 10 minutes later, here's a high resolution photograph from the geostationary satellite. There's the upside down ship. The hull is the same color as the water, but there it is. <laughs> Can you do that? No. No, you do not look for a lost ship from a geostationary satellite. You have to send out airplanes and fly a racetrack pattern. More recently, Gravity, Sandra Bullock and uh, uh, George Clooney, seven Academy nominations. Good movie. You've learned this morning that the basic premise of that movie is wrong. What is the basic premise of the movie? The Chinese have blown up a satellite. There are lots of pieces of debris in the same orbit as Sandra and George. And every hour and a half, here they come, flying by. Bam, bam, bam. And George Clooney is killed by one of these. Can that happen? No. No. Kepler told us 300 years ago, you can't do that. If you're in the same orbit, you have to be moving at the same speed. So yes, there may be a lot of debris, but it's moving the same speed that you are. Now, what if they were going back on the other direction? In the other direction? Well, no, they weren't, because these things were overtaking them. All this swarm of pieces kept overtaking them on every orbit, which can't happen. Now, you can have orbits crossing, yeah. of course, and that's dangerous. So, does this happen sometimes in real life? Yes. In 2007, the Chinese blew up one of their own satellites that was in a polar orbit and created like 2,500 pieces of debris greater than 5 centimeters, something like that. Really irresponsible and dangerous. The green dots uh, is a representation of all the active satellites. The red is the debris from the Chinese satellite, and the white is, in fact, the orbit of the International <coughs> Space Station. Mm -hmm. So yes, th this created a lot of a lot of uh, that you have to worry about. And so this is the Earth. That's too this light. Is, it it uh, does another color. Okay. Um, probably heard of these. James Van Allen was a physicist at the University of Iowa. Um, I considered going there to study under him for my PhD, but I had a serious girlfriend in Ohio, so I ended up at Ohio State, and she of course dumped me during my first quarter at Ohio State, but I, I stayed there anyway. Um, Van Allen discovered that there are two radiation belts and sort of hard to 
show, but and these are fairly wide. This lower one is centered at about 3,000 kilometers and consists mainly of protons, charged particles. The outer one is out much further, consists mainly of electrons. These are dangerous. And so man flights stay underneath this lower Van Allen belt. The GPS satellites, in fact, do come out into, into, into both of these. And you can shield satellites uh, against that, but that takes a lot of weight. And also the solar panels take a beating from these high energy electrons and protons, which come from the sun. So that's why, that's why this number is, is pretty low. Where do we get most of our weather data? Weather data from geostationary, there's a GOES satellite that has the, the, the images you see on the evening news, those come from there, from Mount Vanilla. Yes. Um, tundra. Uh -huh. Yes, yeah, so, um, Kepler has said that you cannot go faster, you cannot go faster in the same orbit. Chloe probably doesn't believe that, because she can make her satellites fly figure eights in the sky and do all kinds of tricks. <laughs> okay, so suppose, Chloe, here's your satellite, and it's in a nice orbit here, and you want it to go faster in the same orbit, okay? Go ahead, Chloe, push that button. It's right in front of you. It's the red one. Boom! What just happened? You just put your satellite into a different orbit. It cannot go faster in the same orbit. Kepler and God says you cannot do that. What you've done is you've just pushed it into a big ellipse like that in which this is the perigee, the closest point to the Earth. So that's what happens if you, if you fire your thrusters to try to make it go faster. This, in fact, is what people do when they try to go to the moon or to deep space. You put it first into this parking orbit, then you fire the thrusters again here, put it into a bigger circular orbit, and so on. Um, something else I was going to say. Um, okay, so that's what happens if you try to make it go faster, and in fact that is a, a useful thing to do. Could you, could you say um, if, something, if we want, well we have sent satellites or um, things out to the escape from Earth's orbit, mm -hmm. what's the best way to do? Well you do that with this, first you put it into this parking orbit, like this, and then you fire the thrusters again here and, and send it on its way. The escape velocity is about 25,000 miles an hour. There's an ideal orbit away from the... There's an, ideal, there's an ideal orbit, yes, which will, I mean, goes out as far as, as, far as you want it to go. But you, you, have to get, you have to get escape velocity to basically escape the Earth's gravitational field. Now, suppose you want to bring the satellite down, which we do. It's time to bring the astronauts down. So you fire the thrusters, you know, like that, to slow it down. And what happens? You put it into a different orbit. In fact, you put it into an orbit which intersects the Earth. You slow it down. It goes into this orbit. And of course, once it gets to the atmosphere, then, then Forget about Kepler because then you've got all kinds of uh, air uh, causing the the, uh, the orbit to change. But, but basically, that's how you do it. That's how you deorbit. You're not technically bringing it down. You're putting it into a different orbit, but one that intersects the Earth. Yes, sir. When you accelerate out of the parking orbit, are you putting it into simply a different orbit with a different center of mass? 
Yes, yes. And unless, unless you give it so much velocity that it's going to just keep going, you know, to Jupiter or whatever, out of the solar system. That's what we did with the Galileo spacecraft. It's clear beyond Pluto now. <coughs> Gone. But still sending that data. Amazingly. Yeah, Ed, I have a question related to that. Um, you know, when NASA sends a probe to one of the planets, Jupiter or someplace, uh, Cassina to Saturn, mm -hmm. uh, it um, they have to get out there and then break the speed, slow the speed down, mm -hmm. or get so, captured to make it into go into orbit, orbit around, around planet, Jupiter, right? or Mars, whatever. Yes. Now, uh, I recently I under I heard that um, most star or large fraction of stars are double stars. Mm -hmm. They have an, uh, they've captured another star. They're going mm -hmm. around each other. Mm -hmm. And they don't have a breaking rocket on them. So I'm wondering why is it that they don't just go in hyperbolic orbits and miss each other and not get the, captured? The why stars? are there so many stars, over a third of them, I think, that have well, that are coming in pairs? Yeah, all right. If you have a double star, if you have a double star, they're they're going to be orbiting around a center of mass, which is probably here somewhere, depending on the size. So they're they're just doing a dance, you know, around as if there were a very massive object here. Okay, last last point. Have you heard of Lagrange points? Uh, no. No. This is a fun concept. <coughs> French mathematician named Lagrange discovered that there are some magic points in the Earth Sun system. Here's the sun, here's the earth, and he discovered that there are five points at which you can put an object and it will stay there. L1 is here, a million miles from earth, on a line to the sun. L2 is a million miles in the other direction. L3 L3 is out here opposite the Earth. L4 is at 60 degrees up here. L5 is 60 degrees down there. <clears throat> if you put an object here, for example, it will rotate with the Earth and stay in line all the way around the Sun. Now, the alert student is saying, wait a minute, you said that's impossible because an object here should be moving faster than the Earth, and it should pull away. Aha! Uh -huh. But this is now a three-body problem. It isn't just the Sun's gravity, it's also the Earth's gravity. And the Earth is pulling in the opposite direction of the Sun. And at this point, L1, the Earth's gravity is just enough to match the Sun's so that it is locked in here. Is that useful? Yes, it is. NASA has a satellite called SOHO, which has been there for more than 20 years, staring at the sun. And here's what you're getting for your money. Some really interesting... Um, I meant the previous slide. It was just, you don't need to see the previous slide. Are you sure? All right, here's the previous slide. You happy? Okay. Okay. I'm coming. I'm coming to next year. Okay. Here are here are four quick images of the sun taken in different spectral bands. These are not all taken at the same time, but it shows you how useful it is to use different spectral bands. Here's a view of the sun. These are solar flares or star storms happening. This is really interesting because this actually shows the sun's magnetic field being all twisted around because there are charged particles moving very fast, being ejected from the sun, and that sort of distorts the sun's magnetic field. Um, here's a big, a big uh, solar storm, a flare, and so on. Here's in a different spectrum. This was a big solar flare that people were worried was going to knock out a lot of Earth communications. I think we turned off some of the most sensitive things. And, and there's another one. Okay, so that's 
SOHO, which stands for Solar and Heliocentric Observatory, something like that. And the reason, again, that it can sit there for 20 years is because it's a Lagrange point, and the gravitational forces are such that it's locked in there. You don't have to do anything to it. L2 is where NASA is going to put the Webb telescope, which is going to replace the Hubble telescope, a million miles on the other side. This is an ideal spot because you can look out in all directions, and the Earth is sort of blocking the sun, which you don't want interfering with the telescope. This, L3, there was speculation, what if the Earth has a sister planet? Perfect spot for it, right? Exactly the same distance from the sun. We can never see it because it's behind the sun. And so science fiction writers had a lot of fun with that. There was a bad movie called The Man from Planet X. Maybe there's a planet there. Maybe there's a National Presbyterian Church there. Maybe there's a wrestler's <laughs> planet. How do we know? Well, we now know there's nothing there, of course, but it was fun while it lasted. And then these other two um, basically just a theoretical interest. Yes, Would it be possible for debris to accumulate at L3? Yes. Uh, in fact, in the Jupiter system, which also has Lagrange points, the, there is a collection of rocks which have gotten trapped at these points because they got there and, and they're locked in because they're because of the, the, the grunge gravity considerations. So to be clear, the, the SOHO um, satellite does, mm -hmm. does not, it, it simply is orbiting the sun, but not orbiting the Earth. Right, it's so, orbiting the sun. It so just stays, it just stays like this all the way around. Just So that would be the difference between it and the, the moon, which also is orbiting the yeah, the, the, moon, the moon, of course, is, is orbiting us. And right? also orbiting the... And it the, has a little gravitational and effect. And it's also orbiting the, 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 the yeah. sun. Yeah. So, let's see how your intuition is. On this scale, here's the Earth. Where would low Earth orbit be on that scale? What's the diameter of the Earth? 8,000 miles. 200 miles, that's like... So low Earth orbit is very, very close. It's, you know, a few sheets of paper, maybe. That's why you're only seeing one or two percent of the Earth when you're in here. Where is geostationary orbit on this scale? Four times. Yeah, I mean, if this is 8,000 miles, geostationary orbit is three Earth diameters away. Okay, so geostationary is about there. Where's the moon? 25, 6 times, 250 times. 10 times further away. So the moon is over by the coffee somewhere. Very interesting to have, you know, these kinds of perspectives. Now, how, how high up do you have to be to consider there's no atmosphere? There is no international definition for that, but the rule of thumb is about 100 kilometers, or 62 miles. At that height, the atmosphere is about one millionth as dense as it is in this room. But that, but it moves up and down depending on solar activity. That's kind of the, the rule of thumb. All right, we have maybe five more minutes. Let me take off my science hat and put on my diplomat hat for a moment and ask, um, um, is it really the Wild West out there, or is there a lot of law that governs what goes on? Well, it's mostly the Wild West, but not entirely. There are some international agreements that govern all this. The Outer Space Treaty says, Thou shalt not put into orbit around the Earth weapons of mass destruction, in particular nuclear weapons. There's an agreement that we will rescue and return astronauts or objects that come down where we can reach them. Um, there's an important uh, provision in all of the star treaties, um, which I can read to you, which basically legitimizes the use of satellites, which we call national technical means, um, to verify these agreements. And it says, uh, this is the wording in all of these treaties, it 
says that the sides will use national technical means at its disposal in a manner consistent with generally recognized principles of international law. Not further defined, but it means the Outer Space Treaty and the usual considerations about national sovereignty. Then it says the parties agree not to interfere with the national technical means of verification of the other party operating in accordance with this article. So this legitimizes the use of satellites for that purpose. There's a convention on liability. If a piece of space junk comes down and kills your cow, uh, the side that put it up there agrees to reimburse you. Um, the International Telecommunications Union regulates satellites in geostationary orbit because if they're too close together, they will interfere with their radio signals. So they keep, the, keep the, uh, that orbit under control. Limited Test Ban Treaty says you will not conduct nuclear explosions in the atmosphere or outer space. Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty says the same thing in stronger terms. You won't do it underground either. What possible future agreements could we have? Well, <coughs> the Russians and the Chinese for a long time have been trying to ban all weapons in orbit. The Outer Space Treaty bans weapons of mass destruction, but there's no, there's no law against having other weapons killer lasers, for example, on a satellite. Uh, the Russians and the Chinese tabled a treaty there. The U.S. opposes it. It had a lot of problems. Um, maybe in the future there could be an agreement that would ban interference with satellites. The U.S. will not agree to that because we want to interfere with other people's satellites if necessary. Uh, there is a, a, a group in the U.N. called Papuas many on the peaceful uses of outer space. They try to negotiate rules of the road. Uh, and then there's an international code of conduct, which sort of began here at the Stimson Center, I think. The Europeans took it over, and they worked for years to, to, try, to, get, to try to get this um, agree. This is what you do when people won't agree to a legally binding treaty. You try to negotiate a code of conduct. And I have the draft. I could read what it says, but I think we're out of time. Basically, it has come down to trying to mitigate the space debris problem, like the Chinese blowing up their satellite. That nobody wants their satellites being disabled by accident because somebody was sloppy with, with space debris. So it, it basically says that, and it says you will not interfere with other people's satellites, but except, except if it's under Article 51 of the UN Charter, which is the right of self-defense. And that, of course, is an enormous loophole, so you can basically do anything you want if you call it self-defense. The result has been this, the, the EU has, I, th I think, basically given up on code of conduct for now, because the U.S. has said it's too restrictive, other big countries don't like it either. Um, and that, I think, is where I should end. Okay. A couple of minutes ahead. Of Great. Okay. Uh, thank you so yeah. much. Yeah.